cloud. And so this is week six being recorded to the cloud. Uh, it is the week on open educational resources in my emerging learning technologies class known as the monster syllabus class. We move into MOOCs and we move into the developing world. So you fit all four weeks coming up. In fact, you fit the whole semester. And I've invited a few of my friends and former students, including Osgur Osdemer, who's a doctor. Osgur now, there he is. He's an instructional designer at the University of South Florida. See, he's got short sleeves. He doesn't need a sweater like I have on. <laughs> and, you know, say something, Oscar. You're muted, by the way. All right. I think you, you are hearing me, you're hearing me now. Yeah. Right? All right. Yeah. Hello, Jima and everybody. So my name is Oscar right. Osdemir. As Dr. Bong said, I work as a learning designer here at the University of South Florida. So usually what I do is like I design and develop online courses. So I'm a former student of Dr. Bong, which is always great. <laughs> he still supports me even after my graduation. So, it, so yeah, this is what I do now. Nothing, none of that's important. What's important, he just got married. Uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah All right. it's over like six months, but yeah, I think, yeah. It's still, a, still on your, you know, a newlywed. It's six yeah. months, so. Yeah, very, very new, yeah. We are getting kind of used to it. <laughs> so it's a process. <laughs> Another former student here is Susie. Susie Gronseth is at the University of Houston. You want to say hi, Susie? Hi, Gemma. Very nice to meet you. Um, I, I'm looking forward to your talk. And uh, just, you are amazing to have completed so many MOOCs. Um, so way to go and and I look forward to hearing how you, what you shared today. Okay. We were just in Houston Friday last week and she gave away the new MOOCs book of, of uh, that came out. So Susie's got probably both MOOCs books. There it is. <laughs> and I've got one holding up my computer actually you know, underneath uh, this computer. So um, and Yu Zhao is my visiting scholar from China. Maria is uh, my doctoral student who's working on qualifying exams, originally from Kazakhstan, uh, now in the US. And Joyce Deaton is in Indianapolis. Do I have that right, Joyce? I'm actually in Richmond. Richmond, right. OK. IU East, right? Yeah, you got it. So you've got this part right. OK, she's, a, she's an employee of Indiana University. Um, so, Jim, uh, so we're going to have a lot of people watch the recording, so we need to get started on this. We'll let people interrupt and ask questions, and I'm going to start with a student question. Someone sent me a question. Others can post some in the chat window. Um, the question that I had sent to me is, a, is an, I think, an obvious answer for you, but I'll post it anyways because people want to know. Someone who has taken and completed more than 300 MOOCs and, and been part of 400 other MOOCs or 700 of them as a student, how many MOOCs have you designed or co-designed to teach? Um, actually none. That's what I thought. And you might have to turn, can you turn up your volume just slightly more or, or not? Uh, how do I do that now? Or maybe just sit a little closer to your microphone. Yeah. Okay, maybe? Yeah. Is this yeah we better? can hear you. We've, we got you. Okay. You haven't designed a single MOOC as a, as an instructor, but yet you've taken all these MOOCs as a student. And so maybe these are the kind of questions I should ask you at the end, but I'll ask you at the beginning. If you were to give advice to faculty members, I have a lot of F questions. I have friends questions and formal and informal and favorite MOOCs and frustration and finding a career. I have all these Fs. So um, if you were to give advice to a faculty member, uh, what advice would you give them on how to design a quality course? What are the things you look for after taking 700 of these you know, what are, what are helpful tools, features, activities, engagements, uh, ma uh, personalities, uh, social presence? What, what kinds of things that attract you and get you to complete the course? 
Um, I think the, the, the first and main thing is the content. And, and so it has to be, um, I think the easiest word is high quality. Um, so, so if we get the content right, um, the next will be the delivery. And that, that lies a lot with the platform. And then, um, so make it easy for students to access the materials, including the readings, um, and then the other part is um, with relation to assignments and stuff, um, how, to, how to complete the, the course, um, it has to be as accommodating as possible. So those, those three things, the content, the delivery, and making completion as accommodating as possible. When you enter a MOOC, how do you know right away that it's going to be a high quality one? What are some indicators or some signs that get you to smile when you when you enroll in that class? You say this is going to be a high quality course. What are the what, what are the signals that you see embedded in the course? Um, the first thing is usually the course title. That that's the first thing that attracts me. Um, so so I look at the title. It sounds like something that might be attractive. And then I look at that small synopsis, that summary that comes with it. Uh, those, those two things, I usually make my decision based on those two. If, if I'll be willing to try this or not. Do you have friends that have also experienced taking lots of MOOCs? And do you talk about, if you do have other friends that took 100 MOOCs or whatever, tell us about that. Um, what it's like to talk to someone else who takes a lot of moves and, and, and compare notes? Well, for me, uh, um, my wife now, but then she, we weren't married. Oh, you got married. Okay. She's, she's taken over a hundred moves. So she was my MOOC partner and that made it easy for me. And then I know I met a few other people online who have taken um, MOOCs, but, but because of her, um, we shared a lot of interests, we shared a lot of course, course stories, and so although it was online, because of her, I had this physical, um, this somebody I could talk with about the course physically. We shared resources, um, especially stuff like downloading material, sometimes we could, we could um, share it, you, you download for this week, I'll download for next week, and so on. So it made it um, not totally, uh, not exclusively online. There was this um, offline aspect to it, which also made it um, easy for me, I think, to complete some courses. Because there was, some courses were really discouraging for me, and then she liked them. She enjoyed them, and I was like, okay, for your sake, I'll keep it. <laughs> yeah. Such as, what was a course that was hard for you that she liked? Um, the first course we ever did, um, the course on operational analysis, on organizational analysis. Mm -hmm. she, she is what we'll describe as more of an art student, and I had been playing with computers for a long time. So I wanted to go to IT, and she was like, oh, no. So I started doing... Um, non-IT courses. And so nearly all of my 330 MOOCs were all non-IT courses. And yet so you were interested in IT. Yeah, so she influenced almost every single one of those choices. I did she, maybe about two or three IT related courses. She changed who you are. And now you're married. Did you meet via the MOOC or you know each other before a MOOC? We met before the MOOC. Okay. And she's in Canada, if I'm not mistaken, and you're still in Nigeria, is that right? Yeah. Heading to Canada soon, are you? Yes, I think so. Very, very soon. Very, very soon. What, what part of Canada? Um, Edmonton, Alberta. Good. That might be the next PCF conference so that we met. We met in Scotland at uh, the Pan uh, Commonwealth Forum conference uh, and it was quite fascinating. You got an award there. Uh, do you want to tell everybody about the particular award that you got? Oh, yes. I got the, um, I was one of two awardees for the excellence in, um, excellence in online and distance education award. It, it was it's given 
um, every three years to about two people from um, Commonwealth nations. I was one of the two last year. What was that experience like? Well, the most interesting part of it was I had never been out of my country. And, and, and so that, that uh, what made me to the and be happy to be where it was. I got the UK visa. It was really smooth. I got my air ticket covered. And so I had, I had this experience. And then we had, we had several, um, we had several meets, you and I, I remember the first day I, I was looking for your, your hotel and I went around and around because I didn't have any money. And so when you told me you were going to give me my first dinner, it was like, that was my only dinner. And so I looked for your hotel room and I, I didn't get it. But it was interesting going out of my country. It was interesting meeting new people and then putting some like, like tangibility to some of the things you see out um, online, you know, like, like paying for a tram. I'd never seen a tram. I'd never bought a tram before. Um, I'd never used my credit card to buy a ticket anywhere, you know, so it was a good thing I had a debit card. And so I, I was able to, to do those little things and, and so, like, like crossing the road, they, they, in Nigeria, we just run across the road, you know. I, and so it was, it was interesting to see that the people in Edinburgh, um, sometimes they use the lights, but most times they don't. You know? So it was a lot of all those um, practical experiences. But not only I mean, that, you got to meet some of the leaders of the field, and that had to be interesting for you. Hmm. It, it was it was it was it was special in a different way. It was special. I met most of the leaders that that I ever thought I could meet, and and then they inspired me in two ways. The first was some some people I saw there I'd only ever seen in newspapers and magazines and stuff, and I got to talk with them. I got to um, share email addresses, contact, and so on. But more importantly, I got to listen to them talk and I got to socialize with them. And it led me into taking some more foundational steps in my life, you know, which was like, I could do what they were doing. I could also be an academic. Too. And so it was, it was even more life changing in that way. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have had that kind of thought if I hadn't had this one-on-one -on -one exposure and interactions with them. Um, so, so there were there were there were multiple aspects to going to Edinburgh that 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 remain with me even now. So basically, taking moves led to an award, which led to a new experience, which led you to think about becoming an academic. And since the conference in September, you've been to another conference and delivered a paper. You want to tell us a little about what that conference, where was it, and in. Did people come to your session? What, we, what did you talk about? Okay, so it, it also came out of that conference. I, I, was, I was there in Edinburgh, and then I, I saw this, um, this, this um, leaflets, this paper that different presenters and organizations hand out. So I got a batch of them. I was planning to read them when I come back home. So I, I came back home, and I saw that one of the flyers had this conference on it from the Open University UK. And the conference was about the impact of MOOCs in Africa. And it felt ideal, it felt perfect for me. I, 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 it was like a topic that I could really talk about. And so I, I did the steps, I um, sent in my abstracts and eventually my paper was accepted. And, and then I was invited to Uganda and this was the second opportunity now to go out of my country, this time to another African country. And Uganda was fantastic. Um, but I think one of the most interesting parts was, was this like, I think there's something like a MOOC celebrity. And, 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 I, and I'm beginning to experience that because I got to Uganda and it was like, hey, come tell us all about this stuff. And, and so I did this presentation. But the interesting part for the presentation, even though it was my very first presentation, 
was I had looked at some of your stuff. I looked at some of the way you write your presentation and I tried to model mine after what you had done. And so it wasn't more, it wasn't very um, technical. Like the way I think books should be, we should, um, um, like the first question you asked me, how, how would you present your content in a MOOC if we're designing it? Make it less technical. Make it more narrative. Make it in story form because people really, really identify uh, with, that, with that format. And so my presentation was more like the story about um, the paper. And, and I found that, that that format worked beautifully because I got to use more than twice my allotted time. And, and then people kept on wanting more. And, and in fact, they had to like, like promise them, okay, just let the other speakers just, just say something and we'll get back to him. We didn't have that time, but it was that, it was that um, enthralling is the word I would use. It, it, was, it was a story about how I came from, from sitting here, more or less, to going around now. Um, so that was it. So you said you got twice the time. I don't want to make it seem like you were rude. I think someone didn't show up at the session and you got extra time. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I was the second presenter. So the first presenter didn't show up. So, so I, got, I got to start in his time. And the idea was I would stop somewhere in his time. And so somebody else could start. But it was like, okay, you know what? Just having taken his time, take your time now. And so I got, I got that extra time. And it was when um, the questions were like pushing me to the third presenter's time. There were, there were four of us in that session. It was like, oh, no, no, no. If we have more time, we'll come back. So I got to get the first presenter who was a no-show. So it has to be fascinating. Go to two different countries in a span of three months or so. That was November, right? And the other one was September? Yeah. So you know, your life has changed and it keeps evolving. You were also interviewed for the Chronicle of Higher Education back in 2014 or 15. I think it's one of those. And actually, I got the article here in April 2015 is your article. And, and I, I sent everyone the paper you wrote for the conference as well, where you reflect on that. And did the Chronicle of Higher Education send you these questions, or is it something that you just wrote and submitted to the Chronicle of Higher Education? Um, originally, I wrote, it was, it, well, to, ask, to answer the question directly, they sent me those questions. But, but before they sent me those questions, I had written an article to them. And so they, they decided that just, just in the last, last week or thereabout, they finally decided that a Q and A format would be a better way, and so they changed it around. It was mostly the same content, but now in a Q and A format rather than um, a whole big boring article, I would assume. So you took initiative, and that's what got you the possibilities. You wrote to the Chronicle about your experiences, and they end up interviewing you, and that led to me finding out about you. And that in turn led to the conference because I told you about the conference in Scotland. And so really it's you taking the initiative to contact the Chronicle of Higher Ed and that led open doors for you. And so a lot of my students write research papers and research papers and book chapters, but it's an article more like for magazines and, and online newsletters and so forth that might get wider audiences and wider appeal. And there are more short little articles in, in uh, newsletters and journals and other things, um, newspapers actually uh, help reputation more than a single, or even having 10 research articles in a, in a journal nobody's gonna read, just one piece in the right place. I'm, I'm, I got known in China for doing an interview on blended learning and I was gonna not do the interview and, and that, changed a lot of things there because I got my translation team found, uh, found out about me and they translated some of my books. Just one thing can, can change your life. So that Chronicle article really did change your life, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it did, it did. And, and, and there's a whole um, longer story behind that, behind how I did that. I, the, the same thing, I didn't know about it. Um, 
I think when I made about 30 or 35 MOOCs real early on, Coursera sent me an email saying, hey, you know, you're among the top 50 students worldwide. And, and, and then we had about 3 million students. And so they said, hey, you were one of the top 50. And, and I, I, I wasn't thinking of counting the number of MOOCs completed then. I was just doing MOOCs. And so their article uh, made me to see that there was some value there was a, a number of MOOCs completed. Um, and so eventually when I got to 100, I sent them the first notice. And, and then they, they were about to start an article, but it didn't, it didn't um, go through. And so that, that gave me that, that idea that an article could be written about 100 MOOCs. Well, I had just passed 100, so it wasn't a milestone anymore. So when I got to 200, I actually now wrote the article, but this time I felt I, did, I, would, I wasn't going to submit it to Coursera because the other day one didn't come out. So I sent it to Inside Higher Ed. But it wasn't, the proposal wasn't very nicely done. And so Inside Higher Ed didn't get back to me. And, and then I got back to some other Coursera staff and, and the PR people and so on. And then they helped me to rewrite and rework the proposal. And then some other students that I had met on MOOCs, instructional design students, I think from the University of Minnesota, there were two of them. They, they all helped me. So there was this team, it, it was, it was it looked like me always, but there was this team who checked over it. And then it was now much more built, um, nicer article. Then I submitted it this time to the Chronicle. And then they just took it almost immediately. So it would evolve from Coursera contacting you for being a top learner to you thinking about it and saying, you know, Coursera was going to do a piece, they backed out, so you went to inside higher ed, it wasn't polished enough and you had help and support from your MOOC buddies and friends. So it's an evolve, it's, you know, it didn't just happen, it evolved from the community that oh, you, were, no. you were in. So no. that's another thing about MOOCs. Is there a community? Do you say, do you think that the, the peers that you decide to take a MOOC and, and look for the peers that might be in there? Um, you said your wife now, but were there other people that also you knew would be taking that one and you would talk to about the course? Well, rarely. Most, most courses, um, sometimes in the, in the course, you could, somebody could say, oh, uh, there's a new course out or something and I'd like to take it and then some of us might go. But, but it wasn't a primary way for, for me to decide on the course. It, it occasionally, um, especially as a community teaching assistant, you know, somebody would say, hey, a, we just took some course and then there's a related course and, and then we could look into it. But, but I spent more time just browsing the course list. And that's how I got my course. That's how you got browsing. it. Did, did Coursera ever give you an award? Um, no, no. They should. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask a couple more. We'll open up to the audience here in a second. Um, I'm got some more F things. What were your favorite MOOCs? I mean, you took a Je Thomas Jefferson MOOC. You took uh, Chinese history, English common law, social ed, ed I can't even pronounce it, epidemiology. Epidemi Someone else can do that better than me. Latin American culture. Uh, data science, you know, what were some of the top things? A couple of them. What were, what were, what did you like? Um, every MOOC was special. Really? Every, yeah, every MOOC was special. Mostly because their content was usually distinct, unique, and, and in many cases, something I had never um, come across before. So for me, it was, there was that that freshness, that, that, that uniqueness to the content, which made it extremely engaging and interesting for me. And then the other part was each instructor came out different. It, it, it looks like, sometimes it looks like it's the same video format, but in reality, it's very different. Each, each instructor had their own signature. They had their own signature moves. They had, they had how they, 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 they arranged their stuff. They had you know, there was, there was this character to every instructor that was different, even in the, in the questions, you know, and, and like something you quickly learn was if by the time you take the first test, 
the first uh, quiz, you tend to see how the, the instructor thinks. Some instructors want the want um, broad concepts and so on and so forth. So after the first quiz, you can you, you sort of know what the instructor is looking out for. And subsequently, you find out that as you're studying the material, you also have this mindset that these might be the sort of things that this instructor might be interested in. And so it makes it easier. You know, there's, there's, there's each, I'll, each instructor is unique. I'll stop you here because Ying's here and Ying's on my research team. And she was coming from Hong Kong, worked with a, a former student of mine in Hong Kong, and he scraped or mind the most popular MOOCs. And he found five things that the most popular MOOC instructors did. And among them was a feedback issue. Among them was enthusiasm. I'm blanking on the other three things. Um, Ying, do you remember what some of the, the most, that study on most popular MOOCs? Ying just had a baby, by the way. So she might have a baby uh, like last week or the week before. So she might not be able to talk, but Ying, do you remember that one? I am here. Sorry, I was a little bit late because I just nursed a baby. Uh -huh. um, I don't remember exactly where they are, but I remember active learning and feedback. Uh, what else? Active learning, feedback, enthusiasm were three then. There it, were uh, no, instructor enthusiasm. And then... Uh, Meaningful activities, I think. Yes. So hands-on activities. Yes. Yeah. There's another thing. You might look that up if you can find that article where we're chatting, Ying, and you, we can pop back in, uh, put it in the chat window. Sure. Okay. Yeah, she's, you've done a couple of uh, studies of MOOCs, right, Ying? Yes. Besides with me, we've just studied um, MOOC instructors and in career development and professional development of MOOC instructors and engagement uh, issues. But Ying's done some things also with WeChat in China, social media, and other, you know, she just passed her dissertation in June. Isn't that right? Um, July, yes. July. I was on the committee, so I should know. <laughs> Sorry, the baby's passing. Okay, yeah. you, you can mute then, um, so we don't get crying babies in this recording, but maybe we should have crying babies. <laughs> Thanks, Ying. Uh, would you say, Jimma, that certain things frustrated you? I mean, you had successes and things you liked. What frustrated you when you took a move? Um, in retrospect, the biggest frustration was usually around the assignment because I like to feel that I had successfully completed the MOOC. But sometimes, I think one of the most frustrating MOOC I did with regards to assignments was a MOOC where it was a really long MOOC, about 12, 13 weeks. And I came in halfway into the MOOC. But the instructor had set it up so um, every week of delay meant you lost some, some marks. And so even though I came in halfway and I got, well, a nearly perfect score, but by the time all the deductions were made, I failed the MOOC. You know, so so those were those were some of the things. But I thought it was unnecessary. I, I had done the work and I passed it very well. And I'd worked twice as hard as the other students because I did it in about six, seven weeks, what they did in 13 weeks, but I, I didn't pass it. So it was that sense of um, recognizing effort. And some moves could be arranged in in some ways where your effort is not recognized. And for many MOOC students, a lot of the benefits of MOOC was that sense of um, one personal re recognition and recognition from your peers. And, and it didn't matter if everybody else in the world felt this certificate wasn't authentic, but you, you, you all in that, in that MOOC knew you worked hard. And so sometimes denying that, that, that recognition by some technical things was, was really, really frustrating. I think oh, that was being one of my penalized, thoughts. get a penalty for being late, this lateness issue, and you know, for coming in halfway through the course. And yeah, so and then so even though I got I got about ninety eight percent average, but but because of the penalties, I got about fifty, and that was failing. Yeah. So the penalties made me fail. It wasn't that I didn't get the, the questions or the answers right. You know, so so it was. Yeah, I understand. We fight battles all the time, don't we? Um, and you also mentioned 
that was a long course, 12 weeks or, you know, and here we are teaching 15 weeks. So it, for the MOOC learner, teaching in three weeks and five weeks is the norm or six weeks, right? Is that the typical length of a MOOC? Yeah, now, um, I think it's decreasing. It, it, it got to eight, six, and now it's five and four. Um, uh, um, I don't really like four weeks more. That, that's just me. I, I, like, I like the longer, deeper engagement. I like, I like the challenge. I didn't like it um, just being like, I, I, I came to learn. You know, and so sometimes taking those four week moves, um, the last MOOC I took was, was split into about three MOOC, three weeks each. Uh, but, but I knew looking at it, it was about a 10 or 12 week MOOC naturally. And so when I count my MOOCs, that's one reason I say over 330 MOOCs. Because if I was to count that MOOC, it would be 335. But I don't want to count it as five MOOCs. For me, it's the equivalent of one MOOC that has been split into three or four. So, I, so I, I don't like I, that's that's personal. You know, the research says students like short bites as, and, and so on, but not for me. I like you, deep learning. Have you taken a MOOC lately? You told me that because Coursera costs money, you can no longer take MOOCs. Are you finding a way to take some free MOOCs or free? content. What are you doing now? Um, I haven't taken, I, I have completed a few edX MOOCs over the years. You know, I stopped Coursera about four years ago, or five years now. And so in about five years after then, I've taken about less than 20 MOOCs, um, one or two open, open UK MOOCs, but, but that's it. It's, so for you, 20 MOOCs is not a lot over five years. For all the rest of us watching, we, we bow to you in, in, uh, in respect for 20. That's 20 is a lot. So over the last five years, you've teach, taken edX and uh, FutureLearn? From, no, from the um, um, what was it called now? It was just Open UK. It, had, it wasn't on the FutureLearn platform. It was directly on the Open UK platform. But, but most of them were from future ed, um, edX, about 18 moves from edX. Okay, uh, Ying put up in the chat window the six things that are in successful popular MOOCs. Structure and pace is important. In video quality, um, the instructor support, uh, the content you mentioned uh, earlier, the, uh, the quality of contents and resources and assignments and assessment. I mean, those are kind of general things. They're not really specific, you know, but those are the components that uh, make up uh, a successful MOOC. And there's a link to the article. And that's an article we're reading in my class for next week, in fact, I believe, or the week after. I'm pretty sure it's for next week. Um, I'll ask you one more question or maybe two, and then we'll open up. Have you found a career? Have you found a career path? Um, I know you've taken the equivalent of five undergraduate degrees and one MBA. Um, you've got the equivalent of five BAs. Have you found a career niche or, or something you'd like to, to pursue? Um, what, what I found was, I think I like learning and I like um, opening up learning. And so MOOC, the only career that I think of now is just being academic. I'm not able to refine it further. Uh, um, I'm just I'm just staggering into it. Like like most things I do, I stagger into it. I, I listen to people and I get feedback and I hear what, what is possible. And eventually I something something comes out of it. But right now I'm just staggering into it. I'm discovering there's lots of costs. Um, <laughs> and challenges and uh, like, like attending conference course were prohibitive and so on and getting your papers published. But I'm stumbling into it. And um, I, I think one, one area that I think I'll really, really get into is, is um, when I was in Uganda, I, I understood that like in South Sudan, I think they had about a population of 10 million but they were expecting only 100 or 150 um, high school, female high school graduates for the year. 
and I felt that was totally wrong. You you had you had about five million uh, under age under eighteen, and you're expecting only about one hundred and fifty to to complete high school. You know that that I felt was wasn't good, and I knew MOOCs could do something, and and that's what I'm thinking about. And then the second one is about health. I I lost my mom um, about two weeks ago, and. And I, and I found out that. Oh, so I hear that. I didn't know that. I, I yeah. lost my mom. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So in, in in retrospect, going through going through the hospital records and what was done, I found out that there were omissions. That that it was just knowledge. These things are already known, but but because I, as the the, the family, we didn't know these things. Um, it just kept on getting worse and worse and worse. And it's the second time this is happening to me. I, I think I've written about it. I lost my brother about 15 years ago. And in one of the MOOCs, I, I realized that what he died from was easily, um, what's the word now? Preventable, resolvable, easily. But, but we didn't know, we had no idea. And so those, those two experiences, I come to see the issues of health. It's not just about the infrastructure now, it's about the knowledge. There are, there are lots of little things, small things that people can do, families can do, even hospitals can do that will really um, make, make people live healthier, safer lives that most people don't have access to those information. I got a lot of them from MOOCs, but, and, I, and so I think that some sort of vehicle to, to, to help put these ideas across would be one thing that I want to pursue. And I'm just working it in my head now. I don't know how it's going to come out eventually. You want to tell them the story? I'm so, sorry to hear all that, but family related. You also had the crisis when you were taking MOOCs. Your technology was stolen? You want to <laughs> tell that story about? And what, how, did, how did you get around that? How did you, you know, tell, tell, tell everyone what happened. OK. Um, like, like most parts, particularly my city and, and many parts of Nigeria, they're not exactly safe. Um, and then so I had gathered some, some electronics, laptop, a um, um, uh, couple of phones, and then um, a tablet. And so for, for people outside, that looked like a lot of electronics for one person. It looked like too much electronics actually had two laptops. And so um, one night thieves broke in and they, they, they broke into the house and they tied me up and, and took all of those away. But it was, it was unfortunate because it was on a Friday, I think. It was on a Friday evening. And, and the way I do MOOCs, um, Friday evening is just when I'm finishing the videos. And, you know, so I, I wrap up the videos on Friday, Saturday, and then I do the assignments on Sunday. And so I hadn't, I had, I had done maybe about half of them. I hadn't done the other half, and all of it was on my laptop. Um, and so I lost a lot of courses. Uh, I think about because at that point I was doing maybe 30, 40 moves simultaneously. Wow! So, so 30 at a time. Yeah, I, I, I think I got a little bit more than that, but I got to a point where I found out that about 50, I could no longer manage it. I think I started <laughs> up to 52, 53, and then I found out that that was my absolute limit. You know? but, so I lost um, a lot of causes, about half of them. Um, I was able to recover some of that. But then the, the equipment, it was my wife. We, I got um, somebody else to give me a computer and I could pay. We don't do those things here. We don't have credit in, in Nigeria. You, you, you can't go to the shop and, and, and use your, first, we don't have credit cards. Okay, so, so if you don't have credit cards, you don't have credit. And so everything you buy is with a debit card and you pay cash outright, you know? So, so if I needed a laptop, I had to have all of the money outright. There was no other way to get a laptop. But we were able to talk to somebody who, who, who arranged some sort of um, purchase plan, an individual shop. 
because she was guaranteeing it. And, and so I still, that's the laptop I have now. <laughs> that's the laptop for the Zoom. Joyce has a question for you. Joyce, go ahead. Um, let's see here, just a second. Uh, so we've been reading a lot of articles about MOOCs and trends in online learning. And from the perspective of the global West, there seems to be a loss of faith in the potential. But when we change the perspective to the global South, it seems like there really is a different story where the market and the enrollment is really huge. And I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are about wh what will be happening, you know? Do you think that the West will just kind of wake up and things will change, things will shift, and um, there'll be a new kind of, you know, reemergence re of MOOCs and their value in the West? Or, you know, I don't know, just take it away. <laughs> okay. Um, I, think, I think MOOCs have a resurgence already. In the sense, like uh, MOOCs are now penetrating the degree um, um, granting area, so you have MOOC-based degrees. So, so that's 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 a resurgence, and I think that trend will only increase. Uh, more and more degrees will be earned or will be um, blended with MOOCs. I, I so so that's one. Um, the other part for for the Western mindset, I'm not totally sure, but this is what I think. I think. A lot of the ideas were MOOCs were going to be able to, we'll, we could use MOOCs to reach the rest of the world. But um, that didn't happen because most of the world didn't know about MOOCs. It was, it was still back in the developed world. And, and at that point, it didn't have much value because already you had, you had the, regular, um, your, the regular brick and mortar schools where, where what people were going to. The rest of the world, we didn't really um, get into MOOCs because of infrastructure and, and access and so on. So um, overall, but right now, maybe like um, uh, almost about eight years later, we are just beginning to catch up to the potentials of MOOCs as, as a vehicle. And, and everywhere I go in, in, the, PC, in, in, in the PCF, in Edinburgh, in Uganda, I find more and more schools talking about MOOCs. One of the most interesting thing was in my country, we have an open university. I think it's, it has the second largest enrollment in the world. But I spoke with senior officials of the open university and they hadn't heard of the word MOOC. That was just as recently as two months ago. So, so I had to tell them this is MOOC. Uh, this is what can be done with MOOC and so on. So a lot of it is where um, we think that in the global south, people have heard of MOOCs. But the truth is that the vast majority of people have never heard of MOOCs. And, and, and we're just beginning to hear of it now. And so I think, I, am, I think that as we get to know, um, more and more people will, will take MOOCs. Yeah, you know, I was beginning stages of all this stuff. So. You know, I am um, one of the research areas that I'm interested in is museums and, you know, looking at educational outreach on museums. And I, um, I was looking at some of the research and there was a lot of excitement maybe five years ago. And then it sort of like died out. And then um, I looked at the Smithsonian uh, to, you know, and I look at the Smithsonian frequently, I'm a librarian, so I'm like very curious the ways in which they are reaching out. And I just noticed that they have now started these MOOCs and it's kind of recent. So I kind of, you know, I think that it's just more a matter of, pe well, a lot of people here have never heard of MOOCs either. And I just feel like maybe there is, the tide has shifted and um, I'm a K-12, a librarian and I think that with online learning really we're we're really reaching a tipping point things are shifting and I think I hope that that is really going to make a big influence on this new um, uh, sector of MOOCs and micro, -credential, micro credentials as well. I think New York Public Library has done MOOCs so you could probably look up some research in fact or paper reports that have come out of New York Public Library and the Smithsonian, yeah, they're just starting to get into MOOCs, yeah. 
Um, Joyce had another question. She says, do you have a preferred platform? Do you prefer ADX or uh, Coursera or uh, OpenLearn? Well, I, right now I don't have any preferred platform. Okay. Um, okay. Because all, all the, I had Coursera, but then Coursera, Looks like Jim is stuck for a second there. Sometimes this happens. Um, Jim, if you can hear us, you might want to reboot boot in. Uh, fortunately, we've gotten through most of the questions I've had. Uh, sometimes you have a little, little delay in this. Um, Jim, you want to refresh? Or you know, I'm not sure if you can hear us now. Does anyone else have a comment or a question? You can unmute your mic if you, you want me to ask Jim a question when he comes back on. <coughs> you know, Dr. Bonk, mm -hmm. before he comes back, what do, you, what do you feel about the projection of MOOCs? I mean, do you feel like that there is, like, we just haven't really crossed the line yet? Well, it's, it's a matter of figuring out what a MOOC is to begin with and be aware of them before we can actually understand and use them and advocate, advocate for. And so the, the, the awareness phase is a long phase. It was a long phase in online learning and blended learning. It's a long phase in, when we were in multimedia and hypermedia. The awareness phase, it, it, as he mentioned, some people right there in his own country have never heard the word nerd, the open you of you know, Nigeria. So, uh, and, and, and so every technology goes through these cycles of awareness, then resistance, then understanding, and then uh, use, and then some issue of advocacy and sharing. I mean, those six stages. And for many people, MOOCs, they're still not aware. We're not even at stage one. So we can't even get to the resistance stage. But for those that are aware, most of them are at the resistance stage. Um, and that's with the, with the, with the micro-credentials now happening and BA completion degrees happening we can start looking at the third phase of, you know, understanding what they're doing and, and doing something with them. Uh, so, you know, we ran into the same problem with online learning and blended learning 20 years ago. And now people are accepting a blended learning and online learning, fully online learning. And so, and, but, the, but MOOC is, I think, a little bit more complex than some of, some of these technologies are. Jim, are you back? Can you hear us? Oh, yes, I can. Oh. Okay. You froze up for a little bit, but that's okay. We have had a little side discussion. You know, uh, the, the conversation in, in, in effect is where are we at in the, in the cycle of MOOCs, in, in the life cycle of MOOCs? And for many, we're still at that first stage of just becoming aware of what they are before we can understand how to use them and go, in fact, use them. So, there has to be a lot of education that, that takes place. And with MOOCs, there are a lot of derivatives. There are, there are, there are other products or other formats of MOOCs that, that people have experimented with. Uh, some are smaller in scale. Some have meetups. Uh, in, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, we had a study where there are smaller MOOCs and they actually, actually often will, students will meet up at a certain, play, at a certain place. So, and whether that works to increase retention or not, it's still debatable. Um, other MOOCs, we had one study in our first MOOCs book where um, it was called a DOC, Distributed Open Collaborative Course. They had multiple instructors teaching the same course the same semester using the same contents, but then they all taught the course in a different way and they had meetups across the, all these courses together. It was a feminist studies MOOC uh, or DOC, they called it a DOC. Others are called Spocks and I don't know, they have all sorts of names and some are professional, some are for professional development or PD MOOCs, some are for tr direct instruction that's called X MOOCs and some are for connecting and hugging each other and lovey-dovey, call, they're called C MOOCs or connectivist MOOCs. So they're different derivatives or different names uh, and there's more than just that. Those are just some of the common ones that have come out there. Uh, you wanna, do you have any sense of that? Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. And, and in addition to those types of MOOCs, I, I learned in Uganda 
that they are also more um, like like um, PD MOOCs for teachers. And then there is this um, Africa-wide network where they are, they, are, they are getting teachers because we have loads of um, unqualified K-12 teachers. And, and so there's, there's, more of, there's more of those um, things happening now. And I totally agree that MOOCs are just starting out. We, yeah, we so the one a... chapter in this book is on TELMOOC, and that's out of Athabasca University and the Commonwealth of Learning. Sanjaya Mishra, who you met, who you know, and, mm -hmm. and others who we had dinner with that night, and I may have had a beer. Um, they talk about that in the book, and I can send you that chapter, Joyce, if you write me an email. Um, but they work with teachers and professional development. So one area for Africa, but not just worldwide, is professional development MOOCs. I think another one is alumni MOOCs. You're reskilling your people who have graduated and who need to update their skills in an area. That would be another niche market to look at. Another niche market is high school kids to learn English. So in the chapter in Nepal, they have middle school and high school kids learning English to get them qualified for college. And some of the students that we've interviewed, not just in, in Nepal or in, in Western countries as well, are learning skills to put on their resumes before they go to college. So they're putting a MOOCs are now appearing on high school students' resumes, which the, 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 the news out there is not talking about. We just hear about dropout rates. We don't hear about drop-in rates. We don't hear about the high school student who takes an advanced placement physics course or math, a chemistry course or advanced math or English. Uh, and that got them accepted. That helped them get them accepted into the college they wanted to go to or help them on the exam prep. There are many being used now for kids taking the MOOCs so they can take the advanced placement course and then they, have to, they can get credits for college before going to college and it reduces the cost of college. So it, it, it may just be the, the first year of freshman year of college that you take via the MOOC and everything else you take face to face in a, in a campus or online or in a regular online course. It may be after you finish college, getting fresh in development. It may be supplementing uh, before going to medical school, you might not have had the right, the one course that you needed really badly before medical school. You need to learn again, you need anatomy. You didn't learn it well. You might take a move to supplement something to get you ready, maybe to go to grad school or get you ready for undergrad. So it's not just about degrees, it's about preparing this for you. Uh, it, many are using for career development and to get them the, the markers on their resume to get them promoted at work or to start a new business. There's so many paths. We can't, unfortunately, people think education is education is education, that we have to be instrumental. We have to do this to get a degree. It's not just about getting degrees anymore. In fact, the majority of the world population is not going to need degrees. We're gonna need credentials in the future. As we move into the 21st century, it's about the credentials one has, the skills and companies one has to get um, a job or to get promoted. Or, and degrees aren't gonna matter uh, all that as much as they have in the past. They don't matter, but just not as much as they have in the past. We already see it with data science. 57% of data sciences never took a formal data science course. They took MOOCs. And that's the number one growth job in the US right now is data science. So when you talk about the the needs that we need in society and economic development that, you know, whatever politicians talk about, people are not going to school for that. They're going to take a MOOC. Yeah. You're laughing, Jim. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. I agree with that. Well, we have another, do we have any other questions from people? Susie's been with us. Susie, you got to have a question for them, right? Sure, I'll give you a question. Um, you know, I, I think it's so interesting that you have found out about MOOCs um, amidst, you know, uh, uh, people that a lot of people don't know about them. I was in uh, Tanzania this summer and did a presentation about uh, some MOOCs that are available for special educators and not very many people had known about them and um, and so provided the information about how you can get the scholarship and be able to um, enroll and and so I, I found it really interesting that um, in my mind when kind of the MOOC idea took off it was to target um, expanding opportunities for individuals that um, didn't have physical access to 
uh, university and, and content and, um, and, and yet we find that a lot of our MOOC learners already have degrees. You know, they, um, they already have master's degrees. They um, come from well-developed countries, you know, with a lot of resources. And so I guess what I'm really interested in is what you think could, what we could do as designers um, and uh, you know, strategists uh, around MOOCs, what could we do to help expand the reach of MOOCs for individuals that, um, you know, really this is a means to access high quality content and, ac and expand opportunities for learning, you know, amidst the challenges of power and internet access and um, the hardware and, you know, you know, you know what it's like. So um, can you speak a little bit more to that accessibility and, and um, what, 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 what we could do there? Um. I think with, with reference to the accessibility and the infrastructure, most of that has improved greatly, especially in my country, Nigeria. Most people that I meet have a smartphone and they watch movies on YouTube. Nigerians, we love movies. So, so I think we, we, have, we have much of that covered. But the other thing is what, what will make them, rather than watch YouTube, to watch um, an edX MOOC or, or, or a video, for instance. What, what incentives do we have? And, and that, that goes to um, more like, why do we do MOOCs? Lots of people, I, I believe, have done MOOCs, not coming from the perspective of the, um, let's say, the, the average African needs. They, have, they, they haven't taken that perspective in. And, and that perspective is about, it's about the same, I discover, for most people around the world. We will take move, moves if it will improve our lives. We have to see a reason why doing this course is going to improve my life. I'll get a better job, I'll have better health or something. And, and for most um, people who take moves, moves appear like kind of like a hobby, something like an add-on. It's not essential to, to uh, our basic lives. And until we, we which, is, we, which is where MOOCs are going, actually, I think we're beginning to, to drive down to really essential needs. Um, like, like Dr. Bong said, um, Professor Bong, sorry, like he talked about um, high school students needing MOOCs to, get, um, to, to, to speak better English. Now that is a need. You know, some of the data science courses that are MOOCs, uh, they, 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 don't, they don't serve a particular need for, for the typical African because, you know, we are hardly programming so much. We're hardly even doing well on basic programming, much less something like data science. We hardly have databases. We hardly have any of those. So, so doing a data science course is like, well, I just want to do something nice. It doesn't have this direct relevance. But things that have direct relevance, some, some institutions are going into them. Teacher training, health, um, uh, and then basic um, functional tools like, like how to use your internet, how to um, in, uh, speak better English, intercultural skills, and so on. Those are basic things that, that um, we need. And, and we're just beginning to develop MOOCs to address those basic needs. And so Susie, uh, why don't you hold up your, um, your book? Uh, she, she's trained in special education. She has a brand new book on universal design for learning. Her book came out almost the same time as mine and um, same publisher. So uh, she had a kickoff with, it should have many chapters from Africa, right? How many, do you have several chapters from Africa in there? Yes, yes. And so when we picked the cover, we were in Tanzania. And, um, and so we just loved this. We were, you know, we were in Africa, and we just wanted to, to feature that we have some very dear friends in South Africa, and, um, and a lot of great work going on there. Um, I, I, I love going back, maybe going back in, in a few months. So um, it'd be great to meet up with you at some point. Sure, sure. I'm sure we could arrange something. Someday. Someday we need to arrange something. Um, 
So Susie's an alum of our program in, in IST, and she's a faculty at University of Houston. Mm -hmm. And another faculty who's an alum of our program at the University of West Florida sent me an email, and she wants to interview you as a single case. She wants to interview you, do some research, single case study. Her name is Mink Young Kim, and she would, uh, so I'm going to try and connect you to Mink Young. She might do a research study about you, okay, just an interview. That, that'd be okay? That'll be fine. That'll be fine. Say, say yes. Say yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> uh, so um, I have one more question for you, but let's see if someone else, Ying or Parama, and Parama's always got questions. Oscar has been here the longest. Uh, we'll start with Oscar. You any, have anything for him? And he's sleeping at work now. That's okay. He's still being paid while he's sleeping. No, he probably can't talk. He's in a meeting. Uh, Parama or Ying, you have a question or Maria? Um, I have a lot of questions, actually. I knew but, you would. Um, she's from India originally, and she wants to work with the developing world uh, to help young girls and boys at risk, um, underprivileged. Yes. So, uh, because the thing is, I know so many people are doing MOOCs and um, I mean, uh, we've heard about you for such a long time from Dr. Bonk. Um, how, how is this uh, going to, you know, like trans, you know, like translate to workplace degrees? Because um, I don't, I don't know how, you know, workplaces view your um, training in MOOCs and that is a big question for, you know, like people who are graduating, you know, with online degrees and uh, things like that. I mean, that is something I would be really can interested I, in understanding how that somebody happens. Knocking at the door. Okay, please go on. Yeah, so sorry. Uh, so it's just that like, I want to understand how you view that as happening. Like, if I have trained in MOOC and I have like kind of self-trained myself, how are workplaces viewing that? Like, are they going to like really treat that as kind of a formal or semi-formal kind of education? And will that translate to job opportunities for me? Um, most currently, like, like um, that, that, that is not happening. Most, most, most um, institutions are not um, taking MOOCs as some formal um, certification. But nevertheless, there's already some strong move in that way, just like uh, Professor Bong said, the issue of credentials. So mm. MOOCs are beginning to form this sort of um, a background to, to credentialing and to degrees. And so it is different today <laughs> from five years ago or mm -hmm. seven years ago when I took mm -hmm. my first MOOC. Right now, there's far more recognition, and I think that it's, it's going along that trajectory. Maybe okay. in another five or seven years, we will get there, but we're on the path now. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's, that's a very hopeful thing. Like, and these traditions and these badges help a lot. But I yeah, just, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. It's, it's called stackability. Stackability, you get a credential right. that stacks into maybe a master's, a micro-credential or a course stepping stone instead of waiting right. for years to get a degree at least get something along the way that's you know you feel you, you get some reinforcement there's some extrinsic reinforcement needed as well as intrinsic right it's, right my last question you're, go ahead student, yeah no i was just saying that in the last gist uh, conference your student who had come from seattle what's his name dr bong roby brandon yes he was also speaking about this yeah, yeah. So they're creating that in their continuing studies uh, department. He's the dean or the vice provost in charge. So after people graduate, he's giving them out, you know. Ying has a question. Um, I see my UPS truck delivering a package. So Ying, you're going to have to ask it. I'm not going to be able to ask except to answer the door. Sorry, I just wait for baby to say. Um, so um, among millions of MOOCs, sometimes you can see that the same MOOCs are under the same topic. So what are your criteria of, uh, criteria of choosing the best ones? 
when you are interested in certain topics, but then you are not sure which one is the best one. How, what are your criteria of making those selections? Well, um, it, it, was, it was really simple. I, I went to what were already the, the, best, the best universities, the best instructors, and the best platform. And so we had um, the three top platforms, and I tried to restrict myself to those three platforms. I, I put the job, excuse me, hold on. Sorry about that. I kept having this interruption. So I, I, I offshored the job of um, pre-selecting MOOCs to um, these, these top platforms. And then so I, I mostly sought for MOOCs within these top pl platforms and top universities. Uh, and then sometimes if I don't get what I want because there were these niche MOOCs that come from very, very small platforms that maybe are talking about something local or, or cultural, then I'll go do them there. But mostly I stopped from edX, Coursera, um, um, MOOC platforms of choice. Does that help you? Yeah, so are you still taking um, those MOOCs that are dated way back in 10 years or six, seven years? So those yeah. courses are, we are talking about like a uh, uh, pool source, a pool of resource instead of an active course. So are you still taking those courses? Well, will you pay attention to the dates? To the dates of its release? Sorry, I didn't get your question. So some of our, the MOOCs are dated way back to five yes. or six years ago, even tens of years ago. So would you still take those courses? Well, um, I haven't been taking much MOOCs recently. I took those MOOCs seven years ago and, and nearly everyone one time it was, take, it, was, it was given. I took them as, as they debuted. Um, but I haven't taken so many courses now, and I haven't really um, done refreshers. Some of those courses have come back again and again, but I haven't taken their updates. I guess what he's saying, Ying, is he doesn't have to look back 10 years to take a MOOC because he's already taken them. <laughs> All the old ones he's already taken. <laughs> so, Gemma, I have a question. Why? Why were, did you start doing the MOOC? It, did your mother say, oh, it's obvious, Jimma was always like this in school. He always did more work than anybody else. He always asked the teacher to give him more homework or took more classes. Is this just the way you are? Or do you think there are many people like you out there? I just haven't found them yet. Are you on, on, do you have an unusual brain that can process 30 MOOCs at a time? and we need to study your brain or your volition and your passion is, is your a scale of motivation would have you way up there or self-directed learning. Are you unusual or tell us, what is it? Oh, okay, um, just to go a bit into that, um, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a poster presentation I'm making in, the, in a conference in the University of British Cali, Cali, Columbia, Canada in June, which I tried to um, discuss that issue. But where I'm coming from, I don't think I am especially unique. I think um, most people can do what I did. It, it was just, it just had to have that confluence of, um, of factors. And that was what produced me because I, I wasn't, I don't think I'm extra special in any way. But I had, I had, like I said, those, those factors in, play, in place at that moment. And, and, and I did that. Because now I find I don't have those factors. And so even though there are much more moves now, I don't find myself doing 200 moves or 50 moves at a time. Now I'm taking it like most people, one move occasionally. But in that moment, there was that confluence of, 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 of factors that created 
that created what I did in that moment. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's something we could study. We're looking at self-directed learning and is it something that's trainable? You know, could we get... Yeah, I, absolutely, yeah I absolutely believe it's trainable. That, that's my point. I believe it's trainable because I didn't get to take many MOOCs in an instant. In fact, I took the first MOOC and, and for me, it took me as much effort taking the first MOOC in, in uh, September 2012 as taking 40 MOOCs in 2015. It was, from, from my perspective, it was the same amount of time, resource, and effort. So, so I felt there was a growth in my ability to take moves the more I took moves. And, and that's the, the, the whole premise of that presentation, that, that we can grow. We, we talk of this um, uh, neuroplasticity, the brain, the brain continues to improve. As, we, as, as I, I, I think that it happened because the more I took the moves, and I, and, I, and I was particularly motivated. I wouldn't have taken them. So those factors I'm talking about include the peculiar motivation. I was motivated to take as many moves as I could see. And so when every new move came out, I also believed that that opportunity was the only opportunity I could ever get. But then I found that my ability to take moves improved, they increased. I, I, I almost failed my first move because it was too much work. But three years later, um, 40 MOOCs was not too much work. Yeah, well, my department chair taught, a, taught an online class with seven students and he almost died. Then he had me teach online. I had 20 and almost died. Then I had 30 and that was easy. The first time teaching, a MOOC, teaching online or a MOOC is hard. The first time taking yeah. a MOOC is hard. You yeah. get economies of scale after it and some confidence and you know what to do. So that's not too surprising, just the scale of it. I think you need to write a book, 30 MOOCs in 30 days, and advise people. <laughs> you know, it could be a nice title, 30 MOOCs in 30 days. Um, you can give me 1% royalties. <laughs> so you know, there, there, there's something there that you could really be helping the human race uh, how, learn economies of scale in, in taking and teaching these large kinds of classes and talking, you know, talking about your personal experiences, I think there's something that would be a value. It wouldn't just be to sell a book, it'd be a value uh, for others that are going to be relying on these new forms of distance learning in order to keep up or in order to get ahead, in order to, to, to seek new, new knowledge. I wanted to talk about informal versus formal learning, but maybe we're going to have to have you come back and talk about that. I think we've gone over time and, I, you know, I, I, we've gone beyond what, what um, does, does anyone have a final comment from any of the people sitting in uh, that could be formed in the, in the way of a question or a comment? If not, I want to thank you, Jim. You, you get the last comment. Why don't you say the last word in this show? Uh, and we'll call it the end here. What would you like to say to all of us? Um, I think I'm absolutely, um, I'm absolutely like, I don't know the word now, but I'll say what I mean. The opportunity to speak with you all, you know, it didn't come because of anything. It came because of doing moves. And it came because of sitting here and having this opportunity. And, and so I, I, see, I see MOOCs not just as something transient. It's something that is permanent. It's something that is powerful. It's something that can actually change lives. I am an example of somebody whose life has been changed by MOOCs and whose life will continually be changed by MOOCs. The last comment you made for me has given me the ideas for something I want to develop. And that's talking about, um, uh, like you said, 30 moves in 30 days. That, that encapsulates it. But, but something I want to develop. And so every time I have this opportunity to mix with people, I get more ideas. I, 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 I become better as a person. And I hope better. I am also able to make the other person become better. And so this opportunity for online interaction, learning, I think they are fantastic and we should continue to preserve and, and nurture them. Thank you so much.
And, and thank you. There's a, in the Chronicle of Higher Ed article, there is a video showing, uh, Jim uh, videotaped his situation and, and how he accesses and, and what a day in the life is like. I encourage all of you to watch that for four minute or so video about uh, the, the infrastructure that he has and what he's able to do with limited infrastructure should be inspirational to, to many people. I think everybody who's struggling with accessing learning should look at what, what you have and how you've been able to overcome many things to have life change. There's the important key, life change. Um, it's been a privilege having you here in the weekly Bonk webcast. Uh, and uh, in Super Traveling Ed Man, it'll, we'll make this video available. I'll download it and put it into YouTube. I'll send you the link. I'll send everybody the link that was here. Um, again, thank you for coming in and we'll give you a round of applause and in the chat window, uh, maybe is a couple words for Gemma. Um, I'm gonna stop this and, and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll stay on. I'm gonna stop the recording and it now is going